हेलो दोस्तों मेरा नाम है जयेश गंगन और आप देख रहे हैं दावारा मुसाफिर शो इन टूडेज एपिसोड आई गॉट एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू टॉक विद लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल कमल दावा ही इज अ वेटरन ऑफ 1965 एंड 1971 ऑपरेशंस ही इज वन ऑफ इंडिया लीडिंग मिलिट्री एक्सपर्ट इन हिज कैरियर विद स्पैन ओवर फोर्टी वन ईयर्स ही हैज डन अ लॉर्ड ऑफ थिंग्स ही वॉज ऑल्सो द फर्स्ट डायरेक्टर जनरल ऑफ इंडिया डिफेंस इंटेलिजेंस एजेंसी इस एपिसोड में लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल कमल दावर पाकिस्तान के डीप स्टेट के बारे में बात करते हैं वो समझाते हैं कि डीप स्टेट क्या है और पाकिस्तान में डीप स्टेट का फॉर्म कैसे हुआ उसका ओरिजिन स्टोरी क्या है हम इस बारे में भी बात करते हैं कि इमरान खान की गवर्नमेंट को आउट क्यों किया गया था क्या इसके पीछे भी एक डीप स्टेट का हाथ था और हम खालिस्तानी मूवमेंट के बारे में भी बात करते हैं ये पूरा जो एपिसोड है ये बेस्ड है लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल कमल दावर की इस किताब ट्रेस्ट विद पॉफिडी पी जो कि बात करती है अबाउट द डीप स्टेट ऑफ पाकिस्तान इस किताब को काफी सारे मशहूर लोग जैसे कि डॉक्टर शशि थरूर जनरल एन सी विज एंड फॉर्मर हाई कमिश्नर ऑफ इंडिया टू पाकिस्तान जी पार्था सारथी सर इन सभी ने एंडोर्स किया है दिस एपिसोड इज ऑल अबाउट पाकिस्तान इस एपिसोड को सुनने के बाद आपको पाकिस्तान के बारे में सब कुछ पता चल जाएगा ऑल दो दे वर सम इंटरनेट इशूज इन दिस एपिसोड जिसके वजह से हम एक डीप पॉडकास्ट रिकॉर्ड नहीं कर पाए बट आई प्रोमिस यू मैं बहुत जल्द लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल कमल दावर सर के साथ में एक इन पर्सन पॉडकास्ट रिकॉर्ड करूंगा एंड आई विल ब्रिंग इट टू यू बट टिल देन वॉच दिस एपिसोड टिल द एंड एंड या कॉमेंट्स में जय हिंद लिख के जरूर जाना सो हेलो वेलकम ऑन द आवर मुसाफिर शो सर it's a huge honor to have you here and to be able to talk with you and also we'll be talking about your book trust with perfidy um firstly the name itself is really amazing and the snake on it just it's like a cherry on the top um so firstly why trust with perfidy especially when perfidy is such a strong word for a neighbor so uh, can you explain that okay i think that's a very pertinent question and i've been asked this by many people you see as you know trust means meeting or an approach yeah. meeting really and perfidy means you know deceit something mm. which is not loyal somebody is not loyal and all that so i wish i could have said or uh, used pandit nehru's words of trust with destiny you know yeah. that famous eloquent speech he gave at the stroke of the midnight hour right when he says when the world sleeps india wakes to its trust with destiny now why i have called it trust with perfidy coming to your question is that unfortunately the pakistanis who were born out of the same womb that is the yeah. womb of mother india right from independence onwards they have been indulging in deceit uh, with us and not right. only let me tell you not only with us but even with their own people and that is why i have tried to chronicle uh, you know the births and the subsequent entrenching of uh, extra constitutional interests in pakistan's various organs of their government which is the deep state and right. if you want i can i'll explain what deep state is as i understand it and uh, as it is commonly un- understood right so so like i would really love to know what is a deep state from you because uh, i have been studying about pakistan through uh, some of their local authors through some of uh, people who have written books on pakistan from india and i have always tried to answer this one question like what is pakistan is it a democracy is it a theocratic nation or is it a military dictatorship and then i read your book which states that it is a, it is a deep state so can you uh, explain to uh, our viewers and to everyone what what is a deep state right again a very pertinent question you see the word deep state is about 60 70 years uh, old and what yep. the deep state actually implies is that uh, you know it hails from a latin word imperio imperium which hmm. means a state within a state right now even in america uh, president eisenhower and before him is harry truman uh, they used to talk about the military industrial complex the cia also be- being something like a deep state yeah. now what is a deep state a deep state are people organizations which are not constitutionally mandated neither hmm. by the law or by any procedure or any tradition or things like that but they are wielding the levers of power within their own startups within their own countries far, far beyond what a constitutionally mandated institution does for example hmm. as i gave you the example of america the military industrial complex well they drive a lot of the american policies 
when some of the, uh, for example, let me bring you fast forward it to now, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war. Who's, yeah. uh, what is happening now there? You know, weapons are being sold in their, for, in their billions of dollars mm -hmm. worth. And who, who's sort of uh, gaining anything out of it? The military industrial right. complex. That is the deep state. Now in Pakistan, now in Pakistan, we have, uh, they, they, were, they were supposed to be a democracy. There's some sort of a sham democracy, poor fellows that they are. And what happens is, what happens is that the deep state there is the powerful Pakistan army. It's intelligence mm. agencies, primarily the inter-services intelligence. And right. the many terror tanzims they control. So this unholy trinity wields a lot of power and all governments, whether it was a recently ousted uh, Imran Khan's government Imran Khan. or the previous governments earlier. Yeah. Yeah, the previous governments earlier, I'm saying also, you know, right since their inception. Uh, right. The deep state has wielded a large, uh, you know, amount of power and they don't let democracy function. They, they don't let the institution functions because mm. they have all the levers of power in their own right. So the deep state in Pakistan is this unholy trinity, which I just explained to you. Right. So, uh, sir, when we look at Pakistan, uh, since its inception, I don't think so. There has been any government that has served its full term. Always there has been either military coups or the uh, government has been ousted by some method. So how does this deep state form in Pakistan? What is its, you know, origin story? No, it formed in Pakistan because the whenever, you see, whenever democracy is uh, in peril or it's weak, then mm. the Pakistan army, and we are talking now particularly about Pakistan, then the Pakistani army stepped in. For example, right. Field Marshal Ayub Khan stepped in throughout right. the government. And, uh, you know, and what they do is they initially try to say, look, we are, since there is breakdown of law and order, there is very bad governance. So we are coming in to help. And after a few months, we'll go back. Even Zia, right. like if you recall, speeches, when he took over, he said, look, it's a question of maximum few months, maximum six months, and I will uh, hand it over back to power. Uh, I'll hand the power back to uh, the uh, democratically elected or we'll have elections. Right. But then once you taste power, then you just don't leave it. And today, yeah, the yeah. Pakistani armed forces, the senior generals and all, they are, uh, you know, rolling in money, whereas the mm. man on the street is struggling. The Pakistani economy is in a very bad way, as we all know. Yeah, but the yeah. Pakistani generals are not going to leave it. So now, but what they've done here lately, although over the last some years is that they have said, okay, look, we have to live internationally. We have to get international loans. We have to have some diplomatic relations with many powerful countries and all. So right. what we do is we will prop up, we will prop up proxies or weak weaklings, uh, like even uh, uh, a charismatic popular leader like Imran Khan was mm. really a puppet in the hands of the yeah. Pakistani army. And what happened? That they ousted right. him. And, now, and let's see how long uh, Shahbaz Sharif and his government lasts. So yeah. they do yeah. take in the important aspects of governance and policy, they do take, they have to take, not they do, they have to take the dictates of the Pakistan army. Hmm. So, sir, let me, let me ask you this one very uh, important question, which is, why was Imran Khan ousted? Uh, was there any particular reason for the deep state of Pakistan to get him out? Or like, what, what is the main reason behind it? Okay. Now, I think we have digressed from the discussion on my book, <laughs> to why Imran Khan was ousted. Well, that's your prerogative as the anchor. Uh, Imran Khan alleges that he was ousted because he was seen uh, getting a little close to Russia. You know, it's one day prior to the Russian right, invasion right. of Ukraine, he was stood there. And he says that he was not following the dictates of the United States administration, especially the Pentagon. And let me also at, at this time tell you that the uh, Americans, uh, you know, have a on-off relationship with the Pakistanis, but one relationship which has been abiding and we don't talk much about it is the US Pentagon's warm relationship with the Pakistani army. Right. And, uh, and whatever the Pakistani, Oh, and the Pakistani army knows that their sustenance, economic sustenance, and in the earlier years, the military sustenance 
was derived from uh, you know the largest of the uh, of the of the United States, primarily the Pentagon. So, uh, according to uh, Imran Khan, since he was not towing the American line, he was he was through the via the uh, Pakistani army. He was actually eased out. And as you right. know, this is going to be a major plank when the next elections uh, are going to be held. Hmm. Got it. Got it. Because uh, this question was important because I think so a lot of audience would also like to know this. Um, so when we talk about Pakistan and the India relations with them, who is India at war with? Is it the Pakistani people? Is it the Pakistani government or is it the Pakistani army? Because these are like the three very different things. And I think so uh, recently we have also seen that Pakistani people, they have come across, they have come out and talked about what its army is doing. So who are we exactly at war with? I think that's a very uh, important question you've asked. And in your question lies the answer. You see, we are we, we, we are at war in a matter of speaking with the Pakistani army. Though General Bajwa, let me just also mention to you, in the last yeah. two, three months, he's been making some very statesman-like you know, statements. Right. And uh, so, so we are predominantly because the Pakistani army does not wish because the perks and the privilege and the, you know, what they enjoy, they are not going to let it go. Simple as that. Mm. For example, if if there's, you know, there are three star generals, two star generals and all, they are controlling. And there's a book, beautiful book on the Pakistani military establishments, financial dealings by, an, uh, by a well-known Pakistani, respected Pakistani lady known as Aisha Siddiqui. And she's written hey. this book, Military Dot Incorporated. Uh, now, that clearly shows that the Pakistani army is holding over a 20 billion empire. You know, they, they got into contracts, into production, and, you know, they got industries and uh, things like that. And they're, you know, and, and all their uh, people in their ordnance factories and things like that are all pre predominantly Pakistani army personnel. And right. the, the CEOs and the MDs and all are all retired uh, Pakistani army officers. So they're having a ball, you know. So they've mm. got all the uh, money, the perks and the privileges, and they're not going to let it go. Now, but they also realize that overall the Pakistani uh, nation is absolutely now down on its knees as far as its economic situation is concerned. And a time will come in a month or two or Three, they may not, may not have money to pay their armed forces or their government, uh, you know, uh, officers and you know the right. personnel who are manning the government. So they also would now like to play up to Saudi Arabia. They like to play up to uh, America, of course, and to China. But the Chinese hmm. also, let me tell you, are very smart. They are making slowly Pakistan a colony of theirs. And right. even Imran Khan was was wagging his tail um, as far as. Uh, China was concerned. So this was another factor why he was also ousted. Because mm. over the last few months, you would have noticed, you know, some of the geopolitical changes which are taking place, not right. only Russia, Ukraine, but the Americans also are now getting a very chary of um, China's resurgence. economically. Right. The complete world order is changing. Absolutely. You're very right. And that is why they didn't, they, they, they knew that... Uh, the, that Imran Khan is warming up. Of course, China, America relations, sorry, China, Pakistan relations have been on the ascendant since many, many years. Having right. said that, uh, the, uh, Imran Khan was actually warming up much too much with China and to an extent with Russia. So, hmm. uh, according to uh, Imran Khan himself, that this is then it was a conspiracy hatched by the Americans to ease him out. Right, right. You see, in this book, I have tried to study the complexities of Pakistan's continuing quest for an identity mm. and, its, in, and its eternal, uh, albeit myopic, self-destructive anti-India policies. Now, right from 1947, to answer your question, what has Pakistan been doing? You know, India looms very large in all its political strategic formulations. And mm. for no rhyme or reason, and as a matter of fact, if they had a little more sense, you know, we also understand that there are billions of people suffering in this part of the world. 
you know the right. fruits of freedom and independence has not reached them you know just see the uh, you know the price rise in pakistan is astronomical 300 rupees for a kilo of water and you know 2 and 3 to 400 rupees for a kilo of tomatoes and all that i mean who hmm. can afford all this but the pakistanis are obsessed and they know about it you know they have a civil society which is sane which are good people hmm. but unfortunately they are in the clutches of this deep state and that right. is why i've written this book that 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 the this that the deep state which professes that they are working for pakistan's progress and stability are actually the chief architects of pakistan's misery and right. they are also now driving their own country for their own selfish ends on to becoming a chinese colony you know right. this so called border road the, the the border road initiative of the chinese is yeah, the yeah. cpec the china pakistan CPEC. economic highways is economic corridor is nothing but an extension of of china's imperialistic policies hmm and and, and if you remember you know about 10 15 in years back or 20 years back everybody was talk, talking in the world that this is going to be an ancient that the 21st century will be an asian century of course right. i included china japan india and also the pakistan and other southeastern uh, asian states but now i'm afraid thanks to china and thanks to their uh, thanks to uh, pakistan it's becoming a century of conflict and not right. the asian century right Yeah. So, uh, sir, as you rightly mentioned, that uh, in within a few, like maybe years or months, uh, Pakistan won't be able to pay their army personnel as well. And as we have seen, the US has denied Pakistan loans. China, in a way, is denying them loans. Russia is uh, at the same place. Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing, and they have uh, Pakistan has the pressure from IMF as well. So, when we look at Pakistan now, and uh, when we see the kind of issues they are trying to create in india uh, one of the biggest issue is the kashmir issue and they try to make this yes. as international as possible every time so why is kashmir issue so important to them yeah you see because uh, if you recall immediately after uh, independence two months after our independence yeah in in the month of october 47 they are they unleash these raza cars and all right. of course they got a bloody nose and they were sent back packing and some areas they have got which is you know the gilgit baltistan area and the pakistan occupied jammu and kashmir area right. now they have called they've called it this jug that it is a juggler vein you mm. know actually it it really is not very strategically important for them but for them you know because jnk was a was a muslim predominantly muslim state so they and what is the rezo datra pakistan it was created as as a as a muslim state hmm. because they felt that india which was a secular country with multicultural country multi religious country and things like that uh but pakistan was born out of being to be an islamic state so it is just right. an extension that why has india got jammu and kashmir they forget about one thing that india is a secular country we have we got the third largest uh, you know muslim population in the right. entire world and more importantly all hues of the islamic faith flourish in india whether you are a sunni whether you are a shia whether you are yeah. a bora you know whether you are a hamdia unlike in pakistan where only the sunnis uh, are, are predominant and they even don't consider the shias right. as, as as part of uh, islam so unfortunately this over obsession with religion is uh, is also an extension of their uh, you know their over obsession with india or a or a or a this myopic self destructive policy they face with of india right but so uh, towards india yes but you you mentioned that uh, pakistan was born out of the religion for the uh, as a islamic state but when we see the modern pakistan isn't it the pakistan which is living just to hate india yeah you exactly because they feel that just uh, you know whenever they have elections 
or whenever mm. they have to raise the temperature they will just start, start talking about india or or you know cross some red line on all start you know increasing ter terrorism and things like that it is right. just to exist because tomorrow if we have peace with pakistan mm. uh, you know and the people of pakistan want peace with us there yeah. are a large number of young students which you uh, which you interact with abroad or when they come to india or wherever we, they meet indians they they are not uh, anti india they don't hate india so much but the pakistani deep state again i'm trying to reinforce what i've yeah. tried to write in this book the pakistan army the intelligence agencies and the many terror terror tanzims they will start stoking up religion uh, you mm. know that 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 we that we are now being fair to our kashmiris yeah you please forget about our part of kashmir and uh, you know and look after yourselves because otherwise you will also you will uh, you know there are the throes of disintegration sind right. is up in arms baluchistan in any case is up in arms and mm -hmm. the struggle for independence by the baluchis and the sindhis is getting uh, you know greater by yeah, the day yeah. instead of uh, tackling their own problems they you know this is like a you know diversionary tactics that they try and create some problems in uh, in the in jammu and kashmir which is an inalienable part of india and will always remain that so right so so one one other thing which is that uh, in the book as well you have mentioned uh, about punjab you have uh, mentioned about captain amrinder singh's book as well lest we forget uh, and recently we have seen that this khalistani movement it has resurfaced and uh, captain amrinder singh uh, in the few uh, i think so few months back he shared some details about what's happening on the border international border and the smuggling which is going on so what do you think is isi doing right now with uh, you know uh, maybe re resurfacing this issue yeah <clears throat> uh, that's very pertinent in today's context in today's immediate mm -hmm. context you see the when general zia lak took over uh, the government the reins of the government and he throughout nawaz sharif right. now uh, what he did was he started off on this k2 operation k2 which is kashmir and khalistan and right. he started supplying arms and money and drugs and what have you through it through their isi to whip up these movements in kashmir and uh, increased terrorism in kashmir and secessionism encouraging secessionism in kashmir as also in uh, in as also in punjab now right. the khalistani movement with uh, with general singh bindran wale and some other disgruntled guys who were in the pay role of the pakistanis they started whipping up the you know anti hindu anti india sentiments in punjab but fortunately the roots of punjab are you know under the, the same roots as uh, roots uh, of north india and you know and there is no difference between sikhism and hinduism and things right. like that and the sikhs on their own and let me tell you the sikhs are the bravest of the brave i've had yeah. the privilege and pleasure of commanding sikh troops they are the greatest of the troops they let the pakistanis have it and they will let them have it every time the pakistanis yeah. try to create problems but right always remember that in a country like india you have to keep everybody together we are multicultural mm. we are multi religious we are multi ethnic we are multi caste we are multilingual and things like that so you also have to be careful nothing is automatic okay and today let me also sound uh, some warning that some sikhs disgruntled sikhs are on the payroll of the isi especially right. in canada uk germany a bit in the us and things like that and they are trying to whip up this uh, k2 or rather the khalistani movement and the pakistanis are going all out of it and maybe the chinese also have a hand in it we never know we never right. can tell so we have to be very careful in handling our minorities as a matter of fact all our communities within this country but be rest assured that our minority communities all over india right from kashmir to kanyakumari they are very loyal very patriotic very strong and they'll give a absolutely you know bloody nose to anybody who tries to interfere uh, in our internal affairs
right right so uh, so i know we are running out of time so i'll ask you last few questions which is and one of those is like and this comes from an audience which was um looking at the india pakistan relationships right now and the kind of trouble the pakistan's deep state creates for india time and again is it important for india that pakistan breaks into i don't know like several uh, states <laughs> that is uh, you see uh, there are two ways of looking at it one hmm. is that if it integrates uh, into two states or three states yeah there's india has to be capable about the spillover you see hmm. that the pakistani army will also unleash i mean they are already very violent against the baluchis and to an extent against the sindhis so a lot of uh, violence will be unleashed and some of the spillover will come to india also hmm. in is india, india is like what have it we've never uh, you know worked to exploit pakistanis fault lines where right. the pakistanis have been crossing many red lines which are indian red lines but they they have crossed uh, many times our red lines but you know we been as a larger nation or if i can call it call ourselves the elder sibling which most of them would not like to hear but the fact is that we have not tried to exploit too many of their fault lines but in case they are in case they create keep creating trouble then like we had the surgical strike as you know we paid them in the same coin so yeah. Yeah, we still have to pay them in the same coin in case they create problems and this was where the pakistanis should be wary of that we are six to seven times larger than them we are more powerful they can be a nuclear state doesn't matter but yeah. we are much much bigger and larger and more powerful and the pakistanis for their own good they're not i'm saying pakistanis the pakistani army for its own good and must control their terror tanzims right. and not indulge in anything otherwise it will bounce back on pakistan pakistan as you know is the epicenter of global terror now they are also suffering themselves having fostered yeah. terrorism they are also suffering themselves and i can always i quoted hillary clinton's uh, you know that great remark she made a dozen times in my articles and writings that if you rear cobras in your backyard one day they'll bite you <laughs> yes sir that that's absolutely true and in fact when the uh, australia versus pakistan cricket match was going on uh, there was a bomb blast in pakistan and that is very worrying for them um, and so last two questions uh, one is how do you see the future of india pakistan relationship now because the deep state in pakistan it has uh, i think so it's growing like cancer for them and india on the the side we want to grow we are not even looking at Ch uh, pakistan right now our main concern is china so how do you think this relationship is going to work yeah so your question is india pakistan relations the way forward or yeah, yeah. is there a way forward okay <laughs> now you know i always i always believe you know i'm a, being a soldier i'm an optimist but mm. hopefully a realist also yeah uh, we would like to improve our relations with pakistan yeah and uh, i think a lot of uh, same members of their pakistani civil society who i've met also during mm. track to diplomacy you know they also they also yearn for friendship with india you know they love mm. coming to india and meeting us and things like that and they also and india is a great example of how a country you know we got our independence together where right. india has reached and where the pakistanis i mean there is no comparison poor yeah. fellows don't even have 30 billion dollars in their foreign uh, you know right uh, foreign exchange the forex reserves yeah. having said that but uh, at the moment i don't see very much of uh, uh, you know optimism as far as the improvement in india pakistan relations are concerned notwithstanding the fact that uh, the pakistani army chief jal bajwa has said that we must uh, get closer to india and keep away the flames of fire from this region you know these right. are his words flames of fire from uh, this region but the point is uh, you know they may for, the thing is if the pakistani army is in absolute power there they are the only ones who can create better uh, relations with india you see hmm. all india Ministers, if you please see the you know history of the last thirty years or forty yeah. years, 
all Indian prime ministers have tried to improve relations with Pakistan. And whenever some relationship improvements are seen, all of a sudden you'll find the terror tanzims, you know, yeah, absolutely. You, know you know, they create some problems and have a blast, this, that, and the other. So hmm. the Pakistanis have to learn first to get internally cohesive and the Pakistani army, let it be. We are not we are not teaching democracy to Pakistan or telling them what to do or what not to do. Yeah. But if you recall also, India-Pakistan relations improved during the time of Jal when Jal Musharraf was in power. And Absolutely, he categorically yes. said that Dr. Manmohan Singh, then our Indian Prime Minister, he said that there'll be no redrawing of boundaries. And you know, which was acknowledged and virtually accepted by Jal Musharraf. After hmm. Musharraf Things again started off because you see the trouble is for the Pakistan army and their deep state, which is the terror Tanzims and the ISA, they need existence. What is their existence? Anti-India, spewing venom right. against India, creating some stupid terrorist problems, and for which uh, today they are also suffering. So they have to get out of uh, this so-called, you know, um, chakra view of mm. hating India and uh, trying to make uh, relations better with india got it got it sir. So. So, so at the moment at the moment at the moment i don't think uh, we can we have we should be you see once you are strong internally mm. externally and you are economically strong everybody will everybody around you in the immediate neighborhood in the extended neighborhood they will all fall in line as far as you are concerned and let me tell you I'm not saying it as an Indian or a soldier or things like that. Hopefully, being a realist, I'm telling you, India is the greatest, the brightest of future in the coming right. in the coming decades. Right, sir. And I I 100% agree with you on this because as a youth, I can see where the country is going and where I want to take it personally. So, uh, sir, thank you so much for doing this podcast. But to end this podcast on a lighter note, I have a question for you, which is now that you have written two books, what are your opinions about is the pen mightier than the sword? <laughs> <laughs> the pen, <laughs> you know, I was asked this question at the Bing Bangalore Lit Fest. Right. And uh, the, the anchor didn't like my reply. <laughs> the pen is definitely mightier than the sword, but but this is, the sword counts when the pen is silent. Wow, that's a, that's a good answer, sir. Uh, you have spoken like a true patriot for the country. And sir, uh, to end this podcast, thank you so much for doing this and for serving the nation. We all thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for your kind words. It was my pleasure and privilege and above all my duty that I joined the armed forces and did whatever little I could for my country. And I should continue to do to be doing so till my last breath. Thank you very much. Wow, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show and giving your message to the world. And also, I would request the audience to go out there, buy this beautiful book. It has great insights about Pakistan and the deep state. I really love this book. So yeah, thank you so much, sir.